And well, folks, welcome to our most current edition of the American Victorians live stream, which might keep trying to read name Slack Ops. This month we have uh, Mark Sibley, author of Mongol Moon. So welcome aboard, Mark. And how about you tell folks a little about yourself? Thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. Pretty cool. I dig these things. Um, I get to sit in my basement alone without the kids and the dogs. So it's a reason for that. <clears throat> yeah, so I, uh, uh, author, Mongol Moon, Dance of Devils, uh, hopefully a third one here soon. And apparently we're doing like a couple of anthologies to expand that, that universe, um, which kind of started with a, just a, a, a little chat with, with Wargate. But yeah, I, uh, I've lived here in Virginia. I'm in Virginia. Everybody knows I'm in Virginia, uh, whole life. I didn't um, know that. No, I do now though. So yeah, you do. Yeah. Northern Virginia, first Fairfax, now Loudoun County. So, yeah, so uh, I've, I've worked here my whole life, uh, uh, corporate crisis manager, war gamer, corporate war gamer. So uh, if, if, you, if I mentioned companies, you would know them. They're all around here, defense contractors, commercial companies, things like that. But, uh, but I got big into corporate war games, and, and people were like coming out of them going, man, that was, that was intense. That was stressful. You should write a novel. I was like, hey, it's a good idea. I want to but I got a job. So, and then I realized I was always going to have a job. So I might as well just suck it up and wake up at 5 a.m. and start writing. So that happened. Um, yeah. And then that was 2017. Uh, started writing Mongol Moon. Um, and uh, took me three years. And the sequel took me about two and a half. So I, I, I don't tend to write fast, which pisses people off. Um, but uh maybe including Wargate at this point. But um, but yeah, that's me. Yeah, just uh, uh, just chilling, yeah. trying to get the kids out of the house. Uh, got uh, got my niece's two dogs while they're in Mexico, so we got four dogs in the house now. Um, a lot of activity, a lot going on. Thanks for having me. This is cool. Yeah. I did see some of the, uh, the, the Twitter bullying that has uh, been going on. Over the past three years? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh, it can be a little intense, kind of a double-edged sword. Like, hey, where's the sequel? Oh, but you have heard of me. Cool. <laughs> I dig it. Whatever. Yeah. You know. So we want that more of your work is the best bullying you can get. That's a we... really low bar there, John. That's <laughs> I'm more productive than George R. R. Martin. I mean, come on. That's... <laughs> I've been called him. I've been called him. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you uh, know. That's still th three years versus well over a decade. It's not really comparable. And my entire writing career has happened since George Martin last turned out one of uh, that series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's uh, he's pissed a lot of people off, and I hated the way they ended that show on the. It, it just like it, it was like the picture of the horse, right? The first season was like all sketched out and beautiful, and by the last season, he didn't write it, so they just threw that shit together, and it was like half of a pony and a donkey, like sketched with crayons. I'm like, come on, guys! I haven't it, even read the book. George R. R. Martin going to be like the author version of like Godwin's Law, where just like if you take more than six months to write a book, they'll be like, oh, hey, he's a George R. R. Martin over here. <laughs> Right, probably. Yeah, yeah, I think it's. I think that I think we're already there, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or like, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors is uh, Robert Jordan, Wheel of Time. Um, I don't think he's going to be writing anymore. No, probably not. And I started reading him when my best friend from high school turned me on to him, and he, you know, I got through the first four books, and then I went away to college. Right, went down to Radford, still in Virginia. Not leaving. We fear change. So um, sitting the down north, there. The North still has a warrant out for you, bro. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, actually, I consider myself a North. Northern Virginia. Come on yeah. now. Um, so I'm sitting there and I'm reading the fifth book. And I'm reading it. I'm reading it. I'm like, there's no way this is ending. And I got to the end and I, I, called, I called up my buddy. I was like, 
if this motherfucker dies before he finishes this series, I'm going to run you over with my car. And like two decades later, dude dies of the rarest blood disease ever before he finishes the series. Oh, I was so mad. But Sanderson, Except that, that still didn't stop him, though. Like he he figured out a way to like keep the notes uh, organized enough for somebody to continue on. So like even oh, death yeah. isn't stopping those books from being written. Mm-mm. Whereas like yeah. George R. R. Martin doesn't have that excuse. No, no. And also his wife was his editor and his kind of his co-writer. So yeah. and he was already talking with Sanderson. So, yeah, it was all good. And I was I was happy. Sanderson wrapped it up. I mean, you could go from book six and skip the middle books and go into 11 and be good to go. Not miss anything. I mean, most of it was just describing dresses and how they brush teeth with twigs and stuff. But I loved it. No, seriously, man, that just it's a lot of detail. The, the best kind of filler. Oh, my God. I cannot even imagine. I mean, I the first draft I did on Mongol Moon, I sent it to my to my first editor that I hired because I indie published it, self-published it. And I overwrote that thing by 40,000 words. It ended up being about 100,000 words. And she stripped my ego, my soul, everything right out of that. 40,000 words. She's like, you just wrote all that for you. That doesn't do anything for the story. I'm like, come on, man. I'm learning. Come on. Give me a chance. So, yeah. Well, well thank God for editors, right? No doubt. No doubt. I can't some, edit. Some people, and, and some people will just complain. I've, I've had... Uh, I've had reviews complaining about uh, too much detail in a hundred thousand word book that other people are saying they needed to take a break because of the sheer constant adrenaline rush. So <laughs> you're not going to please everybody. I stopped reading. Like, I stopped reading reviews on like Amazon years ago because you're not you don't gain any useful insight into them, right? They either really like it enough to they leave you a five star review, or they hate it and they leave you a one star review. There isn't much middle ground. And what can you glean from it? On one book, my first book, I was simultaneously praised for my in depth world building and criticized for my paper thin world building. Thanks. I'll take that into consideration, guys. Yeah. If you don't read the reviews, what do you do for fun? I mean, the best part is when you get like the ones that aren't the one or five star reviews, and it's because that guy like fancies himself an intellectual and uh he tries to like write a fucking paper about your book and right. the themes w- within and all that stuff or you like look the guy up but he also reviews like a bazillion things on it like he reviews t-shirts and, and fidget spinners and everything else you know, it's... <laughs> yeah. and let's let's not forget when they're reviewing the wrong book yep <laughs> really <laughs> really oh yeah. Yeah. you haven't you haven't run into that one yet no, mm-hmm. not yet. This was a running trend with uh, with Pete's books that we no said. doubt. Oh wow! Every time we would see it, we would just pop it up and and show it to him. Just be oh, like that's funny as shit. It's like I, was... I really like the romantic angle you threw in there, Pete. Like fuck. <laughs> yeah, there 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 was one for uh, Ice and Monsters, which is the first one of the Lost, talking about the the characters that had been brought over from the previous book. Now, this is book one. None of the names thrown out there are exist in the book. No, but they needed to. That like you still had one <laughs> book left in the series. You're like, you need to throw Gina in there or whatever. And then uh, there was another one for Rock of Battle, which is the sixth and the final, uh, complaining about how uh, there was no audio edition. It was a one star complaining about there was no audio edition for this middle book where there was one for the book before it and the book after it. And there was an audio edition. <laughs> do, do we think this is like a problem with Amazon? Like there's something screwy with the algorithm where they're legitimately on the page for another book. They write the review, it gets submitted, and then somehow just gets sorted over to an unrelated book by an unrelated That's author. Possible. Or do they just have like six tabs open at once, writing six different reviews, and they just get a little bit just some hardcore con- like re- review guys got that daily review grind, the grind set of reviewing things on Amazon. You know, it just 
he's running around three hours of sleep because all the reviews he does, he gets 50 cents per or so. He's got to kind of make that rent money. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they, well, they, they got to do it to like uh, marry the wizard's daughter and he's like giving them an impossible task. You must review a hundred books in a hundred minutes. <laughs> I don't know. I can't do any of that. I, I don't even know what I did this morning. I'm a little I, disappointed then that nobody ever, I didn't get any negative reviews of my first, my novel, Her Brother's Keeper, confusing it for Her Brother's Keeper, the Amish Secrets novel. You, know, uh, you should do a, 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 a crossover event with them. <laughs> Space Amish. I, mean, I think Futurama already did that. Probably. Okay. If Futurama did it in sci-fi, it's like The Simpsons did it in, you know, yeah. standard suburban sitcom. Everything else. <laughs> oh, what, was it? Was the Simpsons did it gag a South Park thing or a Family Guy? Yeah, thing? It, it was a South Park thing. But that was also it's like when Simpsons was back in season eleven yeah. or something yeah. like that. It was like like they're up to season thirty, whatever I, the hell. 30, I was in 11. college when they did that episode. That was yeah. like two thousand three. So, damn, that was 21 years ago when The Simpsons was still on the air. For I'm certain, old. fucking old. For certain values. Right. Anyway, Mark, when, uh, how did you end up getting the idea for Mongol Moon? I'm I'm part way into it myself. Are you? Are you? Right up. I've got to write a uh, story in the world. So, oh, you're doing it. Yeah. Nice. He roped you in, didn't he? You roped you well, uh, I, I, the big thing was I asked him what the time frame was and said, eh, September. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, that's how we that's how we got some other people because, like, I asked Clay Martin and he was like, dude, bro, I'm so, I'm so, like, I got so many irons in the fire. And I was like, September. He's like, oh, no, dude, I can do that. That's cool. Done. <laughs> yeah, so um, I had, like, I was, I was, at the tail end of my gig at Verisign. So uh, everybody knows Verisign, little check mark at the bottom of your screen. You know, they don't do that shit anymore. They they sold that when I got there at, in 2009. They sold that six months later to Symantec. And so basically all Verisign does now is run .com.net for the world, period, and the registry. So um, the government does not run it. A 800 person company up the road for me runs it. So I got there and I, I'm crisis manager, war gamer, business continuity, all that, all that good stuff. So I did that and I was on call for, and before that at other companies for like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe 15 years nonstop um, doing things like all over the world, but from here, cause I hate to travel. Um, so luckily they didn't make me travel, but I got to sit behind a keyboard. That's how I deployed. Um, That's the best kind of traveling is the one where you don't have to sit on a plane for eight hours. Right. Exactly. Um, so I loved it. Um, but I was, I was so burnt, burnt to a crisp and, uh, and a good spot, good place. I was like, look, it's going to be now or never. And I was like thinking about these things before I left. And I was like, you know, I, I want to write, but, and I've been reading all this dystopia and post-apocalyptic stuff and William Fortune, one second after, really, really inspired me to not do it like him. <laughs> <laughs> really inspired me. I never I, finished I, that one. Personally. I loved, I loved the book. I loved the whole, the way he did it, but I don't. I mean, I read the second book and then I got maybe three chapters in the third one. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with how, how he does things. Um, but he inspired me to, to kind of do it the way I wanted it because all the other stuff that I was reading um, at, at the time, like the, the five years, 10 years prior, was like dude with a gun and a dog and a kid and lights go out. They got to get down a road and they never tell you how it happened and all that kind of stuff. And I, I kept getting agitated. And I was like, ah, just tell me how it happened, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm like fascinated with the satellites and whatnot. And I, I keep seeing these things about these two North Korean satellites, um, KMA2 and 4 or something like that. 
and they go up there and they're they're floating and i i, I watch on this uh on the satellite tracker i don't know what the website's called it's weird it's nyo2 or something.com and i just put those two in there and i was tracking them and every once in a while they would be over kansas city junction and middle of western europe at the same time and i was like that's odd pretty cool pretty odd what if there's like a nuclear device in each one of them and so i was like hey that that's pretty cool i started jotting notes down and i was like what else do i know about nobody wants to read a book about crisis management or whatever you know um i have teenagers i have dogs i hate clowns and i have a really unhealthy fascination with tanks so and so i was like let's let's just build a stupid story around that so i just started writing stuff and and i can't do i have i'm like ocd and adhd i guess so i'm, I'm really screwed up that i cannot i cannot read like tom clancy was was the master back when he was doing his thing right with jack ryan and all that stuff came out and that's what got my interest in the genre i can't read like a brad thor with his scott horbath 23rd book you know just statistically dude should be dead by now right right he can't save the world a 23rd time or whatever and i'm, I'm fearful that jack carr is going to go the same way with james reese it's going to be book 40 you know he's got a walker and all this kind of stuff but, especially since he was terminally ill in the first one right no and i i really really liked that book that to the terminal list like really grabbed me I, I dug it that was the first you know one of these you know navy seals saves the day on his own type bs right um but it worked and i liked it so cool um i i got the second one and and got like again three chapters in, and i was like i can't i can't do it there there's too much going on in in the world or with with people around you and nobody does things alone that's how you die Right. Um, so that's how I kind of crafted Mongol Moon as like this. OK, I got four main characters and I got way too many secondary characters that I probably like more and like writing about more. And so I did this thing where when I finally finished it and I was like, OK, I'm, I'm happy with this. I've had two editors through it. They fixed a bunch of stuff like the one the second editor I had, she she was like, former Air Force satellite person, you know, was in Iraq, um, knew the stuff that I was talking about. And she was like, look, seriously, you've got to come up with different adjectives than the dude's hands were big to describe the size of a person, because that's 40 times I've read that shit now. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I get it. I, I get it. I'll go back and I'll fix well, it. Have you considered how big his hands are? <laughs> I know, right? Jesus. His feet? No, that's something else. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I just really like centered on what I liked. I liked the fact that I have teenagers in my house all the time and the way they talk to each other and the way they talk to me. Right. Um, I like my dogs. So I put them in there, you know, I hate clowns. So that was therapeutic. Um, <laughs> really hate clowns really really hate clowns like I've, I've told people who are the people that love clowns like that i just i don't know i don't know but if i if i walk out of my house to let the dogs out at midnight and there's a clown standing by my by my stop sign in front of my house with balloons he's dead i'm gonna shoot him he's dead <laughs> that's that's not kosher not with clowns so you know it's just this is wrong so i got some therapy there but then you know I, I, I wanted it to to kind of be like people that that like it resonated with people like it's it's just normal people that get put in these shitty situations and they got to band together or do something to get through it. Right. And then and, save the world 23 times. Right. And not save the world 23 times <laughs> because the, the, you cannot save this world. You can only save yourselves. That's what I've created. So. Did that answer your question? I don't know. I forgot the question. I know, right? That was interesting. <laughs> See? Did, did you know yeah. you were going to write a sequel when you wrote the first one, though? Like, you it's know, like I, is this a one-off thing that just blew up? Or was it, uh, it's like, this is, I know this is going to be the starting point for a series going forward. 
No, because when I published it, I, I mean, I was thinking about a sequel. I was like, well, let's just see how this does. Because yeah. I don't think anybody's going to read it. Right? So, even though I left like 1,800 loose ends in it, and I was like, yeah, hey, I feel bad. Bygones. Whatever. So, I publish it, and then guess what happens like the next week? COVID. <laughs> And I'm like crisis management for a defense contractor. And I'm like, look, guys, this is, I don't know what this is. This, this could be, I mean, everybody's wiping down the office with their sanitation stuff. And I'm like, look, I'm judging by the fact of what I'm hearing online. I told my, my boss, who was the CISO at the time, um, by the end of the week, latest by the end of next week, everybody's going to be working from home. That's, this is moving so fast. And I said, I will be going home to work from home this week. And she's like, I don't think that's it's going to be that bad, but okay. We called her up on Friday. You see what the CEO just said? Yeah, yeah. I'm like the a moderator. Time then if you see me bad. running, catch up. I know what's going on, right? I, it, yeah. So I didn't write for like maybe eight months. I was like, this is going to be a bioweapon. Uh, nobody cares. Uh, I'm just going to deal with work because there was a lot to deal with. So yeah, no. I didn't have uh, I didn't have a plan to do that, but my editor at the time was like like six months out. He's like, I haven't heard from you. What's going on? And I, I told him, and, and he was like, Oh, dude, no, no. When people are people need an escape, right? They they want to read stuff to get away from the world. And I was like, But my world sucks too. In the book, <laughs> yeah, the whole thing sucks. But it They're sucks like, for them, not for me. <laughs> right, right. So. So he finally got me writing again and, 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 and that's, and that happened. And then, and then, you know, connected with Wargate and, and it was mostly done. And, uh, and that was that. And now I got to write a third one, apparently. Yeah. I, I will say that some of the, uh, the online bullying was rather parallel to some of the, uh, online bullying of Brandon Herrera. Whereas with you, it was where sequel with him is where AK 50. <laughs> You know, I know the name, but I don't know what you're talking about, Brandon Herrera. He is a, uh, a gun guy YouTuber that uh, also, like, okay. legitimately has connections to the manufacturing uh, capabilities of guns. So he's been designing and engineering and fabricating a 50 cal AK platform. Which is something that oh. nobody asked for, and it turned out was harder than he was thought it was going to be. So it took okay. a while. Yeah. And they've been and harassing the <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the AK platform is a platform I can get behind for politics. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's one right behind me over here. <laughs> Dig it. But, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so he made the mistake of, of expressing his wishes to design an AK 50 and, and his, you know, this is going to happen sort of thing way before he ever like tried to do it so ever since then everybody has just been bullying him okay i get it now i'm i'm up to speed yeah and i knew the name um i just didn't know the reference or the context so i thought he was an author turns out he's not a very good author he has to come out with the with the thing so yeah no i i i don't uh i don't mind the bullying i think it started with shepard he started, he started. It always does. It, you know, it's it's one of these things. By the way, dude's just nothing but a class act all the way through, right? Um, but we don't care much about him. It's just Larry. All all, all we want is Larry, because um, dogs are life. But uh, but yeah. So I I didn't have any book sales. Like I I sold to my friends and family like the first two months, right. and then I had no book sales. And then um, and then this dude reached out to me. Happened to be the like like my muse or my one of my impetuses, if that's a word, reasons I started writing the the, the second book and have eighty uh, second airborne out, right? Because he was airborne. Um, and he actually hangs out with Shapper on a boat down at Outer Banks. I'm like whatever, um, and so he was like, you know, send this to Shapper. He probably liked this. So you know, Shepard's a cool guy. He's got his DMs open on Twitter and whatnot, and so I just hit him up. And he was like, oh, dude, yeah, I'd love a signed copy. Here's my address. I'm like, really? 
<laughs> you don't know me, <laughs> but I sent it to him. And then it, you know, like three days later, or maybe a week later, he like calls me and he's eating SpaghettiOs and he talks my ear off for like 30 minutes about the book. And I was like, dude, do you want to do the narration? This is in mid 2020. It's like almost four years ago. He's like, oh, dude, I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Let's, 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 let's set that up. And then everything went. He went to Hollywood Weapons and work, and I, was I had say, this. Stuff. I love how this is exactly how Terry Shepard talks too. Like it's just, it's like oh no, oh, no, yeah, no seriously, dude, absolutely, no, exactly, exactly. And he's all over the place, and so it's like, it's like maybe six months ago, and I'm talking with the Wargate guys, and like, so who do you want to narrate? And I was like, well, if you can't get John Krasinski, let's get Shepard, and. Nick's like, I played D&D &D with Shepard. Okay, hold up. <laughs> and then that, it all came full circle, and we went through some things, and we got it done. And dude hates me now. He's like, oh, so he calls me. He's like, so in your notes, you want the accents done. I want to do the accents. I was like, do you, do you want to do the accents? Because I don't. he's like, no, I could totally do the accents. I want to do the accents. And then after he finished A Dance of Devils, calls me up and he's like, I fucking hate you. I hate you so much. There was one scene with a Russian, an Iranian, and a Scottish dude. And I had to switch back and forth. I hate you so much. <laughs> it sounded like a, sound like a Borat skit, you know? <laughs> right? or, or an episode from Warriors, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. But he, he, he loved it. He killed it. It was awesome. And I'm, I'm so thankful that he, that he could do it. And uh, and so uh, there's there's more to come from him on this stuff. I think. I think. Nice. It'll be good. It'll be cool. So I tell am, him I, I I loved him in Dude, You're Screwed. Like <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> he should be doing that show instead of Hollywood. Oh. He should still be doing that show. That was the best. Have you guys ever seen that? I have. Okay, not. so it, it, take any survival <laughs> show you've ever seen where it's like, hey, we're going to drop them in the middle of nowhere and they're going to have to find civilization within so many hours. The thing is, everybody else that's not being dropped in there is actively fucking with them if it gets what they feel is too easy. So, and then it's Shepard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, they're all on the same wavelength of how do we fuck with this guy? Like, you know, it, it, it's amazing. And and the thing with him is that he's down for anything, right? And I don't know if you all followed the the Shepard versus Dempsey war, if you follow Demp. No. Okay, so no. Bud Light Sadness is his current handle, right? He's a he's a oil rig EMT guy, right? But it, so he lives down in in southern southern Louisiana so they had a thing going back and forth where one of them liked possum and one of them liked uh something else because possums and fleas and ticks and stuff like that so they had this big war and then I forget who it was I think Louisville Gunn put together the scene from Sicario on the bridge right <laughs> where and he inserted all these little things like crawfish for Louisiana and possums and stuff. And then at the very end, in the back seat of the car, it's Shepard just turning and winking. And he did that, right? And so that's been the thing. And Twitter's such a magical place. I pulled, I got that Shepard thing to put at the end of my book trailer for A Dance of Devils or for Mongol Myth. So when we introduced that, and I was just like, you know, I don't care about anything else. This is just magical that this all happened. And then I could use that clip at the end of my book trailer. It's amazing. <laughs> Twitter. Tw I love Twitter. None of this would have happened without Twitter. That can be said of many things. Uh, and indeed. Good and bad. Yeah. Good and bad. Right. When you write, do you have all your characters thumbtacked to a wall like crime scene photos or do you just yeah. keep them straight? Or can you just keep them straight? Okay. No, I can keep them straight. I don't. I. I, I don't really. Uh, I mean, sometimes I have a a, a a kind of a vision or a, a theme that I want to go into for a chapter, and who's going to be in it, and then I just write. I'm a pantser, total pantser. 
I, I, I don't plot. If that sounds like work to me, you know, doing an outline, I'm not an outline guy. So I just, I just kind of, I just kind of write and see what comes out. And half the time it's crap and I have to rewrite it and rewrite it. And, but you know, yeah, no, I, uh, and that's probably why I have too many characters in my books. Um, and like 200 secondary characters and all that stuff. I, you know, there's a neighborhood in, in both books and there's so, so many characters. And I, I just didn't know how to get rid of some of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you gotta, gotta start calling the herd at some point so I could get down to, to, to keeping things straight. So no, no, I don't have a big whiteboard and stuff. I, I do tend to, I do tend to outline and I, I do it fairly religiously after I had to scrap 7,000 words of my Ooh, third shit. American Victorians book because it just wasn't working. And uh, so I, I've usually got, depending on, depending on the series, I've usually got a, a team or a platoon or unit roster and the outline. See, and even if I may not even have the outline in front of me, but I go through the outline anyway, just to get it kind of mapped out. For my latest, I did a really detailed outline. And then I changed a bunch of stuff anyway, because I had better ideas. And I went through that whole process. So I really could have just made it up as I went along like I usually do. But anymore, I tend to not have that many characters in the last four ones I've written. So keeping track of isn't an issue. I don't, I don't have like the big platoon size elements. Here. It's usually just a handful of characters in this last few books I've written, so keeping track of them hasn't been a problem. Yeah, that 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 became sort of a concern for me because I have I have like uh, like in the first book I had I had extra soldiers, extra Marines, right? That were just there um, that I didn't put names to, but they were just there, and I was like, should I? give them names or are they just there or is it just part of the compliment, whatever. And then in the dance of devils, I have, I, I have a whole platoon of airborne in a plane and I got to pick and choose. So I, I probably should do that, but I actually use a software called write it now that, that lets me, everything's on the left-hand side, like, uh, like your, your file folders and whatnot. So all the chapters I can like rearrange chapters with the, just, drag and drop and I've got all the characters and whatnot and for Mongol Moon that that worked out really well uh Dance of Devils I I didn't use that at all I, it, I just wrote it was weird and I I I am amazed that I didn't screw shit up royally I I got into a plot hole but I dug myself out I wrote myself out of it but imagine doing this shit like old school like on a typewriter oh my god no no no, I can't imagine that. Here's your bucket of whiteout. Good luck. Holy crap. <laughs> you know, you know, the only book I, I've read two Stephen King books. Um, Dreamcatcher, which took me literally two months to get through, and uh his book on writing, which was his journey and how he writes and right and whatnot. So I mean, like him or don't like him, uh, I mean the man is just He's prolific and he's created a culture and all that shit. And he's the reason I hate clowns. So, but in on writing, that was actually one of the best. Take everything else about him aside. That was one of the best books about actually writing and the journey of writing that I've ever read. So um, the way he described, and, and he's a panther too. He doesn't think about anything beforehand. He just sits down and starts writing. And he describes it like an archaeological scene right you know there's something there so you take the big tools and you start chipping around it right and then you get down and you see the shape and then you start taking the smaller tools and you get the outline and blah 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 so he described it that way and that made perfect sense to me in the middle of writing mongol men so i was like okay cool i can't read your books dude but this makes sense to me maybe i don't write like you but i take your advice this is cool so um but yeah how how do you all do it how do you all see that? How do you all see the 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 um, the process? Well, first I write the prompt into an AI machine and then just get like five titles out on Amazon in, in a week. That's nice. I don't I, do any of that shit. I, I think there's some of that going on, honestly. 
especially. It's just oh, I guarantee you. When totally. I see somebody out there like he's got like book forty two in a series they've been working on for only a couple of years, like come on, man, like. <laughs> There's, I'm, I'm gonna do that just to piss you off, and it's all gonna be like cozy mystery boss, bullshit. Like it has nothing to do with what we usually talk it. about. I'm still gonna take out a hit on you. <laughs> like you know what? That, no, that was a, that was a joke, YouTube NSA. Sure. <laughs> it's it's all gonna be the Hallmark Christmas movie fucking uh, uh, formula. But you're the the hometown redneck guy that with a, a heart of gold. Oh, I'm definitely <laughs> taking out a hit on you now. <laughs> you know so what? Like, no. like whenever she whenever she's trying to like hit on you or something, you're just like, do you want to help me put the deer on the four wheeler? Like, and that's all. That's all you say. <laughs> hey, Coop. You know, cozy mysteries have been done to death. It's time to do an uncomfortable mystery. Yeah. Everyone's just miserable the whole time. <laughs> Isn't that a Stephen King book? I think if you end that, you end up with like Fargo, basically. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so now, Pete, I know you're with Wargate. Where are you guys at with your books? Like, who, like where do you publish? Ban for me. And uh, Coop isn't actually an author. He is just the uh, heart and soul of the team here. Nice. Yeah, I'm here okay. for moral support. Okay, we, we've been we've been bullying him for a couple of years, but it's, yeah, it's, okay. it doesn't work. Apparently, you can't just bully talent into somebody. Mm. Uh, okay, I don't know if I you mean, looked, Coop. I don't know if you've looked at uh, not with that attitude. You can't. I don't know if you've looked at Kindle Direct lately, but uh, yeah. talent is not required. That's why I have the AI bot. <laughs> I'm just gonna VTube all of my books. <laughs> that that hit is getting. <laughs> Getting I know, so it's not worth it. I support you, Coop. I think you should be a VTuber. A VTuber. You know, the, you know, you do have a contact in his area of operation. I'm just saying. <laughs> just, I mean, it, it, it won't be pretty. No, I, could, I could make it a probably couple won't of, happen. That's why they do the VTube thing. <laughs> I, I could make a couple jokes about certain people that we used to work with, but yeah. No. Be inside baseball. No, no, I, I, I do like the fact that, like, I, I love the idea of never having written a book myself, but also being on these streams and giving out, like, unsolicited writing advice. And then when Absolutely. people, like, try and figure out what I've written, it's like, oh, no, it's all stolen valor. I haven't written anything. <laughs> <laughs> you scrapped your outline over nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, like that one odious check I was roasting on Twitter the other day, she had a book on Right, learning how to write from great literature that she was selling for ninety eight dollars for an ebook. Isn't that? I mean, <laughs> that's been a joke for a while. It's like how to become Nobody, a millionaire, like I, and it's audience. like a book that's like two pages, but it goes for you know ninety nine, ninety nine, ninety nine per per copy. People, there is nothing you can learn in a book about writing that is worth ninety eight dollars. No. <laughs> No, trust me. I I looked for it. it I did, for there while. is there is a problem on the other side of the spectrum on that though, where like everybody just like hashtags uh, am writing into Twitter and then just like oh. tries to see what everybody yeah. else is doing. Oh, oh yeah, dude. It's, dude. I mean, the good on the upshot is if you want to write a book these days, you can. There is no excuse except you just being able to focus on it long enough. All the all it's the gatekeepers. The, book, that's the problem. The gatekeepers have been shooed away. There are no barriers to entry. You can write whatever you want. You will. You won't even have to face an editor. No one will tell you no. Right. The oh, problem yeah. is, is all the quality control went with the gatekeepers. So, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. No. That 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 I am writing thing. So so. Early on, I say early on, it, like five years ago. Um, so I started following people in the Twitter writing community, right? And there's a lot of good people, a lot of good writers, a lot of cool people. I've met a lot of people, still friends with them, but there's a lot of ass out there. That's just garbage and whatnot. And there were cool things that were happening. Like some people actually tried, like there was the very short story prompts. If you're familiar with those. Dude, it's like, every, like, like, write a, a story in six words or something like that. Uh, well, in the you had to use the word prompt, right? 
and hashtag that, but it had to be like contained within a tweet. Right. Okay. So it was pretty, pretty cool. I mean, a lot of people did some weird things and it was a good exercise in trying to get your writing really tight, like really, really do that stuff. Right. And so I started doing this thing called, uh, called uh, Christopher and Chewy, which are the two dogs in my book, but I did it in their voices. And it was just, it was just mayhem between the fat neurotic pug and my dog upstairs, Chewy, who's a four pound Yorkie with one tooth. Right. And she was security and the pug always just wanted to roll in mud. And I did this, this stuff, but it, they were commenting on what the humans were doing, which was actually in Mongol men. Right. So, so I was trying to do this. I did it for a long time. It's still out there. You can hashtag it, Christopher and Chewy. Um, I think that's what it was. I haven't done one in a long time. But the writing community did cool stuff like that. Then they also, there was a lot of people, a lot of authors that were only in the writing community and only tried to market their books to other writers who were trying to market their books. Oh, my God. Like yeah, on the daily, me. it was it was bad, you know. And it's so, an interesting target audience, people with no money. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I did support a, a bunch of authors and there are there are a ton of great indies out there and in that writing community. But man, is it a there's there's some cess in that pool. That, that, that reminds me, uh, instead of becoming an author, I think I'm just going to become a literary agent and just like basically make people write exactly what the fuck I want them to write. And then just that's what agents do. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. not not give them a career out of it. And yeah. then, you know, if you. Something gets kind of close, but you just don't like that person. You say, "Well, I'm not in love with this, so <laughs> sorry." No, no, but I, I, I get, know. I hate get you. To just list out hate like you. every trope I want in a book that appeals literally only to me, while promising people that I can get them uh, a, a book deal, which it's not going to happen. But you basically, want somebody get somebody to write a bespoke novel just for you. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a super, a super niche sort of genre that. Oh, when you've gone down the Tumblr rabbit hole to where you were in a niche of like three people and you're trying <laughs> to be a fucking uh, literary agent, like, oh, uh, I don't know if you saw that, Mark, but uh, Mike found it uh, on Twitter, and it was like, this was, if if you had told me that this was a 13 year old girl on Tumblr in 2014. I couldn't have told the difference between that and somebody actually presenting themselves as a literary agent. Yeah, that went viral too. They got like almost wow. hundred thousand views. Let me see. Yeah, yeah I. Uh, uh, no, I years did. Ago, Go ahead. A few years ago, just for trying to to see how I could maybe expand things a little bit, and I started looking at some of these literary agents to see about because some of the the bigger thriller publishers. I only want an agent. Want you if you've got an agent. And after about half a dozen pages, like, yeah, none of these people are remotely interested in the kind of stuff I write. Yeah, yeah. I tried to. I I I, I queried Mongol Moon at first as I was getting ready to self-publish, and I did fifty-six queries to literary agents, and I got fifty-six no's. And by that I mean half of them just ignored me. One one lady gave me some feedback, and everybody else just said, "No, it's not what we're looking for." And yeah. so I was like, "Screw y'all! I'm just I, I I actually don't need you. I might not make any money, but I can do it. So I'm gonna go over here to Amazon." Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it, it's interesting how much more important you think they are until you do it without them. And then you're just like, yeah. So I want to, I want to tell a little, a little story. I might keep the name to myself, but the agent I was telling you about, not agent editor, really, uh, that I found on Twitter again. Um, he's a known quantity author, editor, um, really 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 good talker right uh there's there's now a group out there that are called the victims of this person um that we created on 
on on Twitter um, because he he he's he talks a good game. So he has a website. He he draws a lot of views, um, and so I I just pinged him and I was like, hey, how much can I pay you to, or what's your rate to do a review of my Mongol Moon and you know advertise it on your site? <clears throat> and he was like, well, that's five hundred bucks, but blah, 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 blah. And a bunch of money later, and he's now my editor for the sequel. Right. And we're going to do all these things. Cool. Because he knows everybody. He knows everybody. He knows, he knew Vince Flynn, edits Jack Carr, all the stuff. And that's true. Um, but now I've met with other people in my coffee shop that use him, that mention him to me when with their writing and I was like okay so I got him a dance of devils in January early January of last year the contract said okay this much money it'll be two months about four to eight weeks to edit six months later we had a conversation about him helping me get an agent right so he he used that he was like i can edit it i can finish my edits towards an agent or i can finish my edits towards a self-publish and i was like well let's sure why not let's try and get an agent and that strung me along a little bit so i started to have a little bit of a of a thing at that point um and others are now too so anyway Sometime before that, Wargate contacted me. And I was like, what you're telling me is way too good to be true. You mean I just give you my manuscript and in two months you have two edits done and we're going and you have a cover and everything else and blah, blah, blah. And you do everything. No agent. Ah, I don't know. <laughs> what the fuck? You know, um, too good to be true. Um, so... At that point, I had another conversation with this doofus, and I was like, okay, I got his, I finally got his edits back. And I was like, these are not edits. Not at all. And when I gave his edits, when I finally signed with Wargate and I gave his edits to the editors, you probably know at Wargate, Pete, holy shit. They were like, what is this? This is not edits. I'm curious, like, like, uh without getting into the inside baseball like what what kind of edits were they he gave me like a two-page editor's letter that said big big themey type stuff you need to do this and this is how you write this kind of chapter opening to get this audience right and then he went through a hundred thousand word manuscript and about every other page he made one or two edits and he made one comment in every other chapter, maybe, right? So he didn't read it. <laughs> he didn't do shit, right? Because my first editors, my two editors that I paid for Mongol Moon, they ripped my soul out. I got nothing back but red, right? So I know what an edit is. And so gave it to Wargate. Those two editors, they called it the gauntlet. I was like, cool, let's go. I don't have a soul anyway. I don't have an ego. I don't have, I don't have anything. Do it. And it was awesome. It was freaking awesome. Like just being able to be in a Slack channel with editors that are looking at it and doing stuff to it and like asking me questions real time. Like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Right. So Wargate, it's Wargate is amazing. Um, so this guy I've just, I've just written off and ignored, but now I, I know four other people that are stuck in his, in, in, in his orbit because they paid him money. And he is now an author and writing other authors, dead authors books, right? Because of people he knows and the grift that he's gotten into. I mean, he's not a bad author. He's not a bad editor, probably. Uh, I, I mean, I've talked to some people that loved what he did, but uh, I think he's, I think he's a grifter. So so it's just being a grifter and being a bullshit artist. 
Yeah, one or the other. I think I found my calling. Fuck this author shit. There you go. <laughs> I mean, stringing people along is a yeah is big business. There we go. But Wargate is not that, and 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 I kick myself every day because, and and I've got Blaine Pardo to thank for this. Do you know Blaine Pete? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we actually we had, we had before. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so he lives just south of me. And he and I were on another podcast called, initially it was called Writers Fix Problems, but then it turned into the Council on Future Conflict with Joe Dolio and all those guys. Um, so we started that and he was on there and we were talking and he was like, I'm, I'm going with Wargate. And I talked to him after the fact and, and, and Blaine like really was like, dude, if you do nothing else, just sign with Wargate. They're great people. And he was right. So... Here I am now, yeah. sitting in my basement, talking about war game. <laughs> you, you said you wanted to be in your basement. <laughs> I know. I know. I actually used to sleep down here sometimes in front of my PX, uh, uh, PS3 uh, at the time. <laughs> Long time ago, call of duty days. Old days uh... I just uh, shared in the chat the kind of thing that the big publishing companies like now. It's a novel called The Sympathizer by uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, um, which is now being made into a television show. It's about a, a Vietnamese communist infiltrator that came to America in the 70s. Really? In the 60s, what the novel's about, right? It's his first novel, right? Won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the Center for Fiction novel, First Novel Prize, and many other accolades. And he was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2017. He's a contributor and op-ed columnist for the New York Times also. He's a fellow of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's on the Pulitzer Prize board now. Yeah, this guy did not go through a slush pile or the editor gauntlet. He didn't have to hmm. find an agent. He's got all the academic credentials and everything. That's what the big companies publish. Well, right. He got a Pulitzer for uh, fiction about the Vietnam War. Move over, Walter Cronkite. <laughs> hey, 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 I've got some Vietnamese twins that came from Vietnam in Mongol Moon. Does that count? That might count. No, you're right. God damn it. I know. And also, uh, you, didn't go, you didn't go to the Ivy League University, I don't think, either. So. No, I went to Radford, well, maybe. I mean, it, it, <laughs> It's not just well, the literary it's, it's, world. Uh, I think it was Bryce Dallas Howard was. Um, oh, I like. Like she was giving an interview, and she's just like, "It's like I just want people to know, like, how hard you actually have to work to to get into the acting industry." Because when I was first starting out, I went to forty three interview or auditions, and they all turned me down. And it wasn't until uh, my my forty fourth that I got it. And my agent at the time was like, "How did you?" Uh, find the strength to go and perseverance to go through 43 uh auditions uh you know most people would quit by then and people were like you're ron howard's daughter okay and also the fact that you had an agent before you even landed a role you know yeah. and you had the the time and security to go to 43 auditions yeah. it's like you are not the same people that are working three jobs and then trying to go to an audition per week to try and break into the industry <laughs> no but I, I still like her. I like the way she looks. Um, hey, I like Taylor Swift too. So yeah. suck it. Whatever. Oh, there may need to be some more bullying about that. But I mean, yeah. if you follow me on Twitter, I know Pete does. I followed you too. Didn't follow me back. Whatever. <laughs> I didn't you, see it. You I don't want I... any Taylor Swift goodness. Come on. That's all my timeline is Taylor Swift and Chewy. All right. All right, John. Yes, I, I would like to that. You, you got my, you caught my interest. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you're out there struggling and you want to get a book published, don't let the success, don't let the nepotism on the high end discourage you, because there's no such thing on the low end. You can just, you can just put your unedited stuff out there, shovel it under Kindle Direct, and you are a published author, my friends. Now, there, I would advise you actually either go over it half a dozen times yourself and 
edit it or find somebody who's yes. actually reputable to edit it for you because for yeah you can shovel wear all the stuff you want out there but why not actually take some pride in your work and, and in, in most cases for, i would say this for a lot of the aspirants out there your first attempt is probably you should probably consider that just shelving that that take it read it put it in a shelf it's probably not going to be good enough to see the light of day Right. It's just, it's just part of the learning process. That's no, not, nobody that. waits for their first game in the league to start practicing. Yeah. So, right. I, I started tinkering in high school and I was uh, just about 32 when I published Task Force Task Break. So, what did your agent say about that? I didn't have one. <laughs> and I guarantee you that any agent out there would have run screaming from that book. Because not hey, only I, I did a, a word search for all the profanity in here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think, uh, in fact, there were. Uh, it was. Um, it was me. Um, oh, what the hell was his name? There were several several of us who were kind of doing the, the indie mill thriller thing at the time who uh, we did a word search to compare the uh, density of F-bombs in our, uh, in our books. I think uh, Joshua Hood, I think it was Joshua Hood who actually won just because his book was shorter and actually had almost as many F-bombs as, uh, as any of the rest of ours. Well, I, I know the conventional wisdom is like psychologically, like you read each word like three times. Um, so it, which it's, it's always more than you, you wrote in terms of uh, cuss words that the, the reader takes in. It, it does stuff. stand out more in the printed page than it does in conversation. Right. Yeah. right. But my thought is like, like guys like Pete, they're thinking who's going to read this. Oh, all the guys I work with. You know, and they cuss way more than I cussed in this book, so it's going to be fine. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we used we used uh, we used profanity. As, it wasn't; they weren't even words. There was punctuation. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was spaces it, and it commas. Very, like <laughs> f bomb becomes a it's a sort of comma, like when you're thinking, like you can't you don't know what you're going to say yet. You know, so he's going this guy. He's like he's fucking fucking you know fucking. <laughs> He, he's a he's a motherfucker, yeah. right? So fucking, we're it, gonna go. It, fuck it's him a up space. Oh my god! Asterisk. <laughs> it's it's everything you need. It's it's the schmoo of language. Okay, like totally, totally. It, you know what? I, there were some of my elderly relatives read Mongol Moon, and they were like, "Why is there? Why is there? Why are there so many cuss words in it?" I was like, "Well." First, Marines. Two, World War Three, and probably a bunch of guys like locked up in a tank, right? I, I mean, I'd cuss. Someone ripped a fart, and you're locked in. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I mean, that's happened every day, right? So, yeah, I tried to be. I tried to be uh, inventive. With stuff, and one of the things that I got right, talking about writing certain things in, like in Mongol Moon, one of the characters is a Navy commander, but she's the commander of the International Space Station, and she's having a a a, a, a link call with with her with her husband and her daughter. Her daughter's kind of like my daughter in the way she talks, right? And at the time I was writing it. My daughter would always come up like when things were like weird. She'd be like, what the hecky decky, man? What the heck? <laughs> right. And so I wrote when 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 she's on the thing on the video and the cosmonaut and the Irish or the Scottish astronaut are like having words, you know, the daughter's like, what the hecky decky? And this dude, literally, he's like, and he appears out of nowhere in my dms i can't respond to him i don't know how that works he doesn't have me blocked but he's a merchant marine right and he's like 
Nobody says hecky decky. That's stupid as shit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, blah, blah. And I can't respond to him. And then he's gone. But we follow each other on Twitter. It's in Twitter. I don't know how he does that. It's weird. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's like, okay, I, I, I'm sure like your typical like merchant mariner isn't fluent in like Zoomer slang. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm totally, uh, that's no, fine. But like, I'm, let I'm, me I'm, have a conversation and explain it to you, dork. I'm, I'm just imagining his voice being like Popeye the Sailor Man when he's saying, <laughs> like, "Oh, kids don't talk that way. Nobody says that." <laughs> you know what? That 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 reminds me. I gotta get. I gotta go back and listen to Shepard say that line. <laughs> I also have to go back because see, this is you. You need you need to clip the audio version just to and have that as a reaction as you're uh, in oh, yeah. your podcast with Blaine. There's 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 several things that are going to happen here, um, because Twitter is a magical place. Okay, <laughs> just follow me here, right? So, me and Terry have been going back and forth about eggnog for a few years now, <laughs> right? I don't know where y'all stand. I don't fucking care. Eggnog's not and shouldn't be consumed, right? So that said, if you got to cut me, cut me. I don't care. Just that's that's why they put the booze in it, is right. so that you don't care anymore. Right. So, in A Dance of Devils, like two years ago now, I'm writing this scene at Christmas because I just got done sparring online with like 400 people that love eggnog, right? <laughs> and like oyster snot. And the, the club found out about you, huh? Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so, and so I write this scene where the Marines are hanging out in the court and they're doing their maintenance checks and whatnot on Alice, the tank. And, 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 and there's this 17 year old, you know, teenager that comes up and she's like, what's going on here? She just lost her parents, blah, blah, blah. It's a bad thing. Right. But the Marines are having eggnog. They have a carton of eggnog and a bottle of Jack and they're mixing it. Right. And she walks by and in Russian, says eggnogs from pussies and then she grabs the bottle of jack and takes off with it and i just wanted in that moment terry shepherd to narrate my book so that he could say eggnogs from pussies <laughs> and i didn't know if it would ever happen but it did and he hates me he hates me so much <laughs> But it happened. Uh, you know, your your author career is just specifically designed to troll your own friends. Mm. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, I like money, <laughs> yeah. but I, it's not much. But you know what? Uh, pulling. I mean, they say write what you know. They don't mean if you're an accountant, write about spreadsheets. God. Right? Don't do that. Right? Writing what you know is your life history, right? I, I mean, you guys know it. You live it, right? So it's like I have a F-16 pilot in Mongol Moon. His call sign is Hooligan 1. I love soccer. There are hooligans, right? You write what you know. I call, you know, his his call sign is Coyote. I, I mean, his flight's Hooligan 1. His call sign's Coyote. His call signs coyote because I howled like a coyote one night at a resort in Pittsburgh. And it's not, I won't repeat it here, but it was on a landing strip in the middle of the night. So that's cool. <clears throat> so you write what you know, you bring your, obviously you bring your life experiences into the work. It may seem stupid to other people if you try to explain it to them, but when you put it on paper and you attach it to other things, that's pretty. It, it's pretty cool that it could resonate with other people. Um, yeah, it it adds an element of verisimilitude to it because this, I don't know that word. Don't use words around me that I don't know. Believability. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, uh, because I mean, in order for it to come. Uh, to to be believable, it has to be something that would kind of happen in real life. Somebody can see it happening. So if you take experiences that you've had and, and put them into the book, people who've had the similar experiences are going to know exactly like, like, oh, he got this from, from this, or he's really done that shit because that's something that 
everybody outside of this would never expect to happen or doesn't actually believe would happen. And yeah. that's how you can make your um, characters and stories relatable as opposed to just making them the exact same uh, race and mix of sexual hangups that the, that you, the author, or you think your audience wants just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the coolest thing that, that, that I had responded to me was one of the homies on Twitter who I've actually met in real life. He's a air force tech sergeant, um, met him at Farmageddon. Um, but he was cooler even before that, because he helped me with a dance of devils with my, cause I I've, I've never been, I mean, I've been in a C5A at Dulles airport when I was 10 at air at, at that, plain yep. day and okay, they had all the right. all the stuff there right and i got to walk through it right i didn't want to use a c-17 i didn't want to use all the cool stuff it had to be an old broken down hog right so that's what i used and i got dudes to 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 help me on twitter right i got dale stark to help me with the with the with the a-10 chapters i got Pickle and Cavanistan, who are Cav Scouts, to help me with the tank stuff. I didn't know, I literally didn't know, that when you put a round in the main gun and it fired, it burned the whole round up except for the, the tail plate, the butt plate. So it's like a bunch of uh, the tuna can tops hanging out. No clue. I had no clue. I didn't serve in the military. I served in the civilian, whatever it is. So... Um, it's it's great that one of my editors, and, and I'll get back to this homie, right? The Air Force guy. One of my editors, and again, I don't care who you are, what you believe, blah, blah, blah. If we're cool, we're cool, right? And she is, a, she was a, still is, left wing, gunshot survivor, hates guns, right? But she read Mongol Moon and she was honest with me about everything. She told me who she was and what she hates. But she was like, Mongol Moon was not glorifying anything. It was just people in the moment. And I loved it. Right. And she was like, what you should do, because you have so many different cultures and things in here, you should get a cultural sensitivity reader to read this to give you ideas about how you can soften certain things and i was like okay because world war three has got to be soft you know oh my god no it's going to be the most horrific thing like haiti hey we're barbecuing people let's go <laughs> right so so i put i i actually put that out on twitter and dude responded and he was like and i know him because he's he's like hawaiian mexican and tech sergeant air force blah 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 and he was like this is the most non-political, totally relatable, cultural, correct, like, book ever. You don't need anybody to review this shit. I just did it. There. Go. Whatever. You know, you know why? Because I grew up in Northern Virginia, which has everybody. And I sit at the coffee shop every day, and everybody's in there. I, I, I talked to two IDF guys last week, and there are other people sitting in there all day long. It's just, it's just crazy, man. You write what you if know. Somebody, if somebody wants to be culturally offended, and it's usually not an actual member of the culture they're getting offended on behalf of, they're going to be. Again, we're getting... Uh, right. yeah. 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 It seems guys so remember collecting that? that, like, the people that would be like, nah, this is good. Fucking, they're not going to be cultural sensitivity yeah. readers. You know, it's like, they're not going to market themselves as that. You guys, you guys remember the uh, the review of Escalation about that? Yeah, that basically hallucinated the entire first chapter, <laughs> just because the bad guys were jihadis. Oh, oh my God. now I got to read y'all's books. Are you sure? I'm not going to get. Uh, I'm not going to get any writing done. Which about? Yeah, so they were uh, Albanian, but the guy was like, "Of course, he makes the brown people the bad guys." I'm like, they're talking about turbans and. Hate crimes and it's like they're, order, they're, are Albanians brown people? Like, did, 
they're they're doing a hostage rescue against some Albanian jihadis in Slovakia. Yeah. So once upon a time in the Balkans, there was these Ottomans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does anything bad come out of Albania? Come on. That's just being unfair. <laughs> that, Mike, that is culturally insensitive. You know, I that's, had, that's why you need cultural sensitivity readers. It, it was funny. Uh, a friend of mine, guy I went to EOD school with, his uh, wife's like hippie mother read Dead Six. This is a woman who collects and saves like plastic bags to recycle them, right? Like that kind. Of, she loved it. Like this is this is way outside of my target audience, right? But she loved it, so I was like, "Hey, okay." The character, you know, okay. why? Because it shines a light against the military-industrial complex. Okay, dude. <laughs> it kind of does. It was. <laughs> I mean, people read into that all kinds of different things, and that were intended, but that was okay. It had wider appeal that way. It, 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 it you gotta admit, Mike, it is rather insensitive to uh, terrorist Cthulhu worshippers. <laughs> there was. There was I one, did enjoy the spirituality of the Muslim man. Yeah. There was one negative review I remember looking at where somebody was really offended by uh, Adar saying that, you know, uh, Muslims do not, you know, butcher and eat people or cut people's organs out like that. Like, like I, I wasn't saying they were. There was explicitly in the book that that particular character was not an Islamist. He had his own thing. He, he hunted people for sport. Yeah. And, but. I think if you do a, need examples of those, I think there um, was a, I think there was a language gap in that review. Yeah. I don't. I think the reader yeah. was uh, ESL. So I, I, mean, I, I think I did. I think I did name a terrorist in one of the later uh, American Victorians books. at are just because. Pete, do you have a problem with the word "yeet"? It is cringe. Oh no! So from now on, I'm calling you "yeet," Neilan. <laughs> I'm a grumpy, I'm a grumpy old Nealon. man, and I'm going I'm to read that now. That's seriously going on Twitter tomorrow morning. As soon as I, am, I wake up, I'm going show. to reach through the internet and strangle <laughs> too. In my, I was saying, oh, we're all friends with big tech now, huh? <laughs> in my, in my books, like most of them are, are science fiction, so I don't. I usually don't have a lot of like current slang because it's not in a current setting. I think the closest I've come recently was in. Uh, this one here, Trouble Walked In. There are guys, they meet up and they plug into their uh, neural connections for uh, like uh, VR sex, right? I call them coomers. If you've been on the internet, you know why that's funny. But that's that's close as I've come. Uh, I, I mean, plus it, most, most of my characters are somewhat older vets who are just not going to talk that way I, I i had to put it in a dance of devils because it kept coming up on my feed on twitter yeah well so so that's the problem with like uh, or the inherent consequence whenever somebody writes a near future uh thing and so it's like the people that would be fighting the wars would be military age males you know it's like if you yeah. want if you want to follow an e3 in you know the 2030s they're not going to be the 45 year old vet. They're going to be like right. the 23 year old, which means that they were born in 2000, which means they're a gen alpha or late zoomer, which means they're going to speak like that. So now you have to have your fucking uh, uh, absolute killing machine war vet speaking like a zoomer. And so <laughs> I uh, uh, hopefully well, bam, bam, bam. I'm pickle Rick, bitch. Yes. I mean, yes. Oh no, seriously. That's awesome. Cause well, I got, yes, pickle in my, I got pickle in my fucking seat. Yes, that shit. Yes and no, awesome. Chris. I mean, I've, I mean, we've all adopted slang that we didn't used to use that. I mean, even just saying something is cringe. I didn't say that 10 years ago. That's something I picked up from the internet more recently. I mean, we saying cringe is actually cringe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you started saying it cause you stopped being cringe. Right. Oh no, I haven't stopped being cringe. <laughs> if anything, I'm worse than ever. Face. The other, the other thing is, as an as an instructor, I've worked with some younger dudes, including one who just went to go get, who just got commissioned and went to Benning to go be an infantry officer uh, last summer. And a lot of this slang, honestly, is an online thing. They, most yeah. of these these guys don't use this kind of stuff in regular conversation. 
it's stuff you pick up like it's a it's like gamer slang or internet slang. I don't know how necessarily widespread it is outside of that particular subculture. You know, yeah. I actually when I got to farm again the first time, we all literally talked exactly like we talked on Twitter. <laughs> and we didn't like I got there early, so I knew who the the early dudes were, the OG guys were. But then everybody after the fact, everybody was talking exactly like Twitter. And I was like in my element. It was awesome. And I'm like in my 50s. Let's go. I'll talk like as a teenage girl or cringeworthy or whatever. Let's go. I love it. Let's do it all. I, I, I'm just happy to adopt it. I'm, I'm just happy to adopt the uh, hip young kid slang so that they will immediately stop using it. Because yeah. nothing will get them you to know? stop using a word. Then it's like when your mom is just like, was like, I was like, oh, are you kids playing the Pokemans? Like, you know, everyone's like, okay, we're done with this. Not game. anymore, we're not. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. It's called an email, mom, not an electronic mail. <laughs> oh. Now I, I'm going to have to go over to my mom's house and like fix her email shit. I'm going to have to like, explain that shit again. Because my brother lives with her and he can't fix her mail. I don't know why. He's there. I don't know. Uh, <sighs> you can just, you can figure it out on the World Wide Web. You know, I think we should on, bring back on the Netscape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should yeah. bring back information super highway. We didn't get enough mileage out Fuck of that. that. I'm bringing back a series of tubes. Okay. Jesus Christ. <laughs> He was you know how I aligned over that one. You know, this is funny. I mean, it's funny to me. It's not going to be funny to anybody else, but it's funny to me, so I'm going to interrupt the story. So when I was at Verisign, I, I described to people how the internet worked. And I described it as a series of tubes. Cancers running around tubes, right? So Verisign told the hamsters where to go. The tubes were like AT&T and Verizon. Those are the highways, right? The hamsters were the content. But Verisign controlled the pieces of cheese all over the place where the, where the hamsters would go. And people were like, that makes semi-sense, Simley. The hamsters that don't almost like makes That almost makes enough sense for us to, like, use it. But we're not gonna. <laughs> well, the, the I'm like, but it's hamsters in tubes, motherfuckers. Come on. The best part was is that was the the series of tubes thing was an analogy from somebody that actually knew how the internet worked that was made fun of by an entire population of people that did not know how the internet worked. <laughs> you know what's they, funny? They, when Veriston hired me to be their it's in commander, their emergency yeah. manager. I didn't know how the internet worked either. I mean, the, you nobody really thinks about it until like they have to know. It's like, all right, how does a fucking A level node work or B level node? Like all that shit. Like nobody. I didn't even know, know that. Know that. I just Pe needed. Yeah. People still think it it worked like Wi Fi is how the internet is connected. Like they don't know that there's like undersea cable fucking uh you know pathways that need to be maintained and there's like physical fucking. And when are we going to talk internet. about that vulnerability? Yeah. I, uh, Jesus. Like, I remember I had a job uh, a few years ago. <laughs> this one dude we work with, it blew his mind. And we were trying to explain to him that Wi Fi is actually a tiny little radio. You know, it's just <laughs> like in your house. <laughs> yeah. Like in your yeah. phone, and there's a receiver in the. And the FBI van outside. Well, uh, <clears> the <throat> cell phone itself is just a fucking radio, but people are like, no, yeah. you don't have to press the button to talk. Like, it's all. It's either wires or radio. That's that. Those, those are your options. Right. We didn't invent the new cell phone wave. Like that's. So so there's something that so I I went back over your 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 podcasts your live streams not podcasts. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, didn't mean to have to subject you to that. No, I did because I like this shit. Um, and you talked to Korea about doomerism. Right. Yep. yep. Uh, there's a lot of that shit, dude. You know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> right. And I'm, I'm part of the problem. However, 
so I just wanted to touch on it briefly, or maybe not. Um, like, I do a lot of risk management, right? And there's a lot of bad shit. I mean, literally, this is how I explain it to executives, like big animal pictures. You are on a rock hurtling through space, spinning on an axis next to a big ball of nuclear fusion, right? Something bad's going to happen. But since when? Right? Anytime. Could be anytime. Right? So so bad shit's going to happen. Right? So just take that as the background. But, I mean, humans are animals. Right? They do bad things. They're barbecuing people in Haiti. I mean, Haitian barbecue. Come on. Hey, but look, South okay, Africa. Listen, I have... But I've read from a credible source in the media that they're not eating people because they're starving. They're eating people as a way of gang intimidation. So supposedly that's better. That's okay. That's okay then. If it's they're a doing, tactic they're, they're and not a survival because mechanism. They, want that to, is, they have to. That has got to be one of the most retarded bits of actually I think I've heard yet. No, it's not actually. That's fucking cope. Uh, right, because it's scientifically proven. If you eat human even a little bit, you get the hunger, and you just can't stop. And then it's you a, become the Wendigo. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how Wendigo form. Great. Now they're in the now they're in the Caribbean. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hayden. Yeah, they're in the Caribbean, and I can't go back to Bermuda. There's a triangle. There's all kinds of uh, God damn it. For, fortunately for us uh, anti Wendigo people, uh, Haiti doesn't have any forests anymore. Um, so because they probably ate them. Well, they don't have any forests anymore because they deforested the entire... You can actually see the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic from space because one side has no trees in it. So. I'm going to have to check that shit out. That's cool as shit. <laughs> yeah. And, and and the DR is not playing around. They're sending all those fuckers back. Oh, no. DR went straight up Madra. Like, they yeah. fucking... <laughs> They're like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. They're building, like, the Bruh. most sophisticated... They're making a wall that, like, Trump wished, like he could even conceive of it's by got the way like, like the, the Glen drone 12 the is excellent yeah they're they're like they're just uh gathering up any uh haitian illegal immigrants and uh sending them by truckload over to haiti and just dumping them on the border there's no like uh transfer of custody or anything they're just like yep here you go you're on your side fuck off and because there's like two countries there yeah. so you're only going one way <laughs> yeah. We don't have to do paperwork. We know where you're going to be. Out. See ya. Also, there's literally nothing in uh, their shared history that would endear them to to keeping Haitians over there. No, not at all. Not at all. And it's funny because my 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 sister in law and her husband with their crew were down in the DR like two weeks ago. I'm like, really? Why? It's just like, no, it's great down there. Oh, yeah. Like, like DR, way over there. DR's like, fantastic. Oh, so, okay, cool. Rock on. Especially Rock if on. you're a baseball fan, you get to see like all the next like 100 best prospects. <laughs> like, yeah. Just Jesus. walking around. I mean, this is like, like, so, so my, uh, my cousin was getting married and she picked Cabo. Right. This is like probably 12 years ago, maybe. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not going. I'm not taking my kids to Mexico. You know, back then when it was okay, when it was probably okay. Right. And she's like, but it's Cabo. And I'm like, okay, let me do some research. And I had a full tool set. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's just Cabo's down here. Let's stay away from the pause. Let's, yeah, okay. Cool. I'll just close my eyes and it'll be fine. Um, so we go there and we have a great time. It's all good. I had the best yellowfin tuna I've ever had in my life. It's magical. And then we come back and then one year later on that beach, tourists were murdered and massacred with dudes with AK-47s. Cartel came down from La Paz. And I was like, see what I was talking about? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus Christ. I actually, uh, I actually knew a dude who was doing some contracting down that way. Oh, know, really? Years ago. And uh, I saw some of the photos of the corpses hanging from the overpass just outside of Cabo. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's it, it, it's everywhere, and it can be everywhere. It yeah. can be literally anywhere. It doesn't matter if you feel safe or not. Yep. And, and they're sending it all up here. Yep. You know, I think we've been here for a while. I think we talked about this. It already. has, but it's been a it's been a symbiotic relationship. It's it's shifting from that. I think we talked about I this think. in a prior stream, but I did get a kick out of all these dudes on the uh, in the political chatterbox sphere who have been anti-war. Like I'm so we you know we need to get out. Iraq was a mistake. Afghanistan was a mistake. We need to get out, but suddenly they're all gung ho about sending the military into Mexico to fight the cartels. Like, oh, oh, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the problem with that. Fun. Yeah, the problem with that is as soon as you cross the border, they jumpstart their stuff in the U.S., which they're already here. Like, that's not a foreign war. That's that's here now. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that's that's been at the risk of sounding a little political. The the stupidity of the open borders bit when you have the nastiest irregular war on the face of the planet on the other side of that border. Uh, there's there's no words. Yeah, I mean it's 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 horrific. I mean, it's Sicaria. I mean, watch the movie. I mean, shit, that shit's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, I do have questions about like uh, storing bodies in a house, though. Just it, it seems like there's yeah, easier ways to get rid of that. That's a little weird. I don't. That know. That was that was why it took me more than one try to get actually watch Sicaria because it's like they just dump it in a landfill. They just found they just found one in uh, where where was it at the time? Uh, Igna, Igna, uh, Ignacio or something like that. Uh, they'd found like 20 bodies in the local landfill. Yeah, but you're gonna say eggnog, and that's why Mark doesn't like it. <laughs> what? What don't what, I like? What are you trying to say, Ignacio? Eggnog. Yeah, it's they, they dump cartels dump bodies in eggnog, and that's why you don't drink it. God damn it. There's the eggnog <laughs> shit again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Mark does bring a good point. We we do have to go back to that uh, episode with Larry where we were talking about doomerism and then just like insert a, a point of it. It's like everything we said doesn't apply if you live in Mexico. Like that's just, you know. No, because they're in it. Yeah. Yeah. You they're have a right to be blackpilled if you are, you know. <laughs> I mean, literally, literally the scene from Sicario when the dude takes Emily Blunt up on the up on the roof and at night and, and has her watch. The tracers, the tracers and the yeah. fucking RPGs and shit. It's every day. Yeah. It's every fucking day. I did have a question about like when um, after the, the famous uh, uh, border crossing scene and all that yeah. stuff, when she's like, that was fucking illegal. And I like went back through the um, scene like five times. And I was like, no, they followed every ROE. Like nothing about this was illegal. Her, yeah. Her, entire, her, her character was entirely fucking retarded. Right. Yeah. Yes, it was. She's hands down the worst part of that movie, and I have other beefs with that movie too. But I have beefs with the movie, but 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 I think they picked her because she's F. Obviously, they picked her. She's FBI, so they could go do their thing, and they didn't care about her. Yeah. Whatever, whatever. I just I just dig the movie, like the like the movements across the border and the hanging bodies, and uh, I don't dig hanging bodies. I don't. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Shh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I, I do want to see. I didn't see the second one, but if they make a third one that takes place in Haiti, I'm definitely watching that because I want to see how they're gonna. <laughs> Sicario three, Soul Food. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we have Coop on the uh, on God the, damn it, the heart and soul of the squad. I you can see. hire me as an editor, but it's just going to make it worse. Like, yeah, this is this is going to be my whole Twitter experience tomorrow. But, you know, you were saying like it's you know it's okay to be a doomer if you live in there, but it's your average like your average Mexican who lives in those conditions is still more upbeat and happy than like your your doomer anon on Twitter whining about how the West is collapsing. You know, okay, but they they have talked. There, there's a there's another thing there is that kind of doomerism. 
is what just feeds the machine of more Sicarios and more and and just it feeds into the uh, the cartels because if everything's fucked anyway, you may as well get what you can out of it. That's the attitude down there. Yeah. After they finish the season of Dragon Ball Z, though. I mean, there's, there's a, uh, I think it's out of, uh, I think it's a uh, cartel land. Um, they actually had a camera with uh, some of the, the meth cooks in, it's, it's either Sonora or Michoacan. Yeah. And they flat out just say, yeah, we know this is evil. We know it's poison. We know it's killing people. But we're poor, so we're going to keep doing it. Man, which, like, it's funny that they're not the ones that go for, like, the OnlyFans and that shit. Like, that's an entirely Western, you know, first world thing. They're just like, eh, might as well do the math. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I, at the same time, imagine trying to uh, start your own uh, sex work without the cartels say so down there. So Yeah, yeah. that's probably... Uh... They, they, and that's the other thing is that a lot of people don't quite understand, including all the, the, the drug legalization types. Oh, if we just make them all legal, the cartels will shrivel up and go away. Yeah, it's not just narcotics, folks. Yeah, so here's the thing, though. Yeah, it's not just narcotics, and that... The thing is, the cartels, their business model isn't, uh, you know, drugs. Their business model mm -hmm. is mo more violent than you and, like, mm -hmm. ruling through fear and all that shit. They are still going to do that even if they're in completely legitimate businesses and industries. And the, the drugs have only ever been a means to an end in the first place, in the end right. of the power. Wasn't the one uh, you were uh, uh, telling me or, like, you sent me the article where it's, like, the most money uh, the cartel has ever made was by stealing oil from Pemex, not drug trade. Yeah. That, and then that was that was ten years ago. Yeah, there are uh, people who get busted for running black market avocados. There's a black market for perfectly legal goods because they sell them. They steal and the them. And they sell them. You know, it's and the cartels have taken that over too. Yeah. But it, most it's of the, also mostly like, avocado, most of the avocados coming out of California now, uh, the cartels have a hand in. Yeah, well, the, that's the thing. It's the cartels. It, they want a hand in everything because they yeah. want control and they want to be able to subdue anything that's ever going to rival them. Um, which, but I don't know. It, I I highly doubt you two have been following the um, the hip hop industry uh, inside baseball, but which what the shit that's coming out with like P Diddy and and all that stuff is basically he was Harvey Weinstein of the the music industry and that shit. And they would control each other by allegedly by like making each other do like horrible fucking illegal or just gay shit with uh, uh, drugs and orgies and all that stuff and film it and hold it as blackmail. Very Epstein like all that shit. Music's not an illegal industry. OK, so it's like we can't legalize music and fix all this shit. OK, but that's how the cartels work. It doesn't matter if the industry is illegal or not. So that, that that kind of explains that uh, the cat cat Williams. Yeah, comment. no, no, no. He was he was talking yeah. expressly about that. Yeah. So yeah, and they, you know the cartel guys they're not like cutting out dudes' hearts and eating them in a you know you know like trying to ape some Aztec ceremony from hundreds of years ago because they're because of economic reasons. You know that that's a life choice. Yeah, I was gonna say they they did do that. Uh, there was uh, they were. They, one guy actually got caught because he kidnapped an American tourist in, I think it was, uh, fuck, what, what Mexican city was it? It's, it's one of the, uh, the major touristy Mexican spots. I don't know if it was Cabo or, or somewhere else, but he kidnapped an American and used him in like some voodoo fucking Santeria God human it. sacrifice. Oh, I hate that shit. That's yeah. how the voodoo war start. Oh, yep. I don't like that. And, but this was like back in, I want to say either late 80s, or early 90s, maybe even into the 2000s. But it was, this has been going around for, for a while. Yeah. It, Cancun. Right. Thank you, Pavlo John. Yeah. Uh, so that's how they found out about it. But the American tourist was not his first victim. And in fact, 
I think they made a shitty like horror movie about it too. Um, so, of course they did. Yeah. So like the cartel guys get off on violence. It's and yeah. they'll find whatever uh, you know weird pseudo religious reasons to do it. Right. It's so not, yeah. So 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 to it's have, not going to go away if you legalize drugs. No, no, it's not. And to have these idiots, literally twenty miles that way from me, say, "Hey, we should put." you know, teams in Mexico. Fuck you. Yeah. Jesus Christ. You take, you want the Taliban, but cartel. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's not do that. I mean, if it's something that, that we as a country decide we need to do, we can might, do it. It might come to that, but we shouldn't kid ourselves about how ugly it's going to be. No, it's going to be bad. Yeah. It's got, yeah. And there has, I mean, that, that, that is, cartel. That is a war that is going to have to be waged with a level of ruthlessness that we have not seen since the 40s. Yeah. Yeah. And that it makes me take pause. Yeah. <clears throat> but really, that's the really other problem is, is it's going to be but, that ruthless. It's going to have to be that ruthless. And it's not across the Pacific. No. It's, it's not even across the border. It's here. It's in your neighborhoods. It's, it's all, in all the neighborhoods. Yeah. It's going yeah. To Absolutely. Like, it's going to be but like the Israelis are dealing with fighting Hamas. Yeah, you know, damn right. But here's here's the other thing: is at the same time we can't just sit and hope that it stays at a low background roar that eventually will go away. Either. It won't go away. It won't go away. Not with everything else happening. I mean, you have to look at all the risks that are building, right? You have to you have to look at the financial risks. We have a massive debt problem that. You know, I, I just sit here and, and and watch. Well, all of all of the people on TV say, "Hey, here's our or here's our debt clock." Holy shit, dude! It's it, it's a hundred, it's a trillion dollars every hundred days. But but Mark, what if you legalize the cartels and tax them? You know what? <laughs> you see how that works out? For you. Yeah, yeah, I've heard see. I've heard dumber ideas than that. Though. I mean, like, come on, man. I mean, yeah. it's it's. You know, it's going to get down. It's going to get down to really, really medieval shit. You know, hiring, it really is hiring SpaceX to go find an asteroid full of like precious metals and using that to pay off the national debt is also a crazy <laughs> plan that works with the cartels. So it's, I mean, hey, let's get Bruce Willis in his state. And let's <laughs> get drill, going. baby, drill. Yeah, drill, baby, drill. I mean, I like it. It's cool. But and he's up there. He's up there in a space level, unable to actually speak, so he can't right. say, "I don't know shit about drilling." <laughs> well, okay, anybody can become an astronaut, but you got to spend a lot of time to learn to be a driller. <laughs> so, oh. so, so on the doomerism thing, I, I, I know we we hit it and we went around it a little bit, but. Yeah, there's a lot of people on Twitter that are that are doomer, doomer, doomer. But I I find myself going in waves, right? I mean, I wrote a doomer book. I mean, there, I, I I mean, I think we all have kind of touched it. <clears throat> but I mean, I wrote like the end of our kind of civilization, right? As it were. Yeah. Right. I destroyed our world, and so I have to. I have. I feel like compelled to restore it a little bit a little bit not much but a little bit and so that's the tack i take and that's how i find myself on twitter based on on my menstrual cycle right you you have to go and i i, I go for a while with holy shit this thing's happening and holy shit that thing's happening and then i'm like but also, you have to give both sides. I think you have to do that. So I tell people, look, and sometimes in my, in my GMs, in my good mornings, I tell people, look, you have to build a network. You don't, don't, don't focus on guns and bullets and shit like that because the, the majority of you are not going to be in a fucking firefight. Right. You're going to be trying to 
you know, gather together, build fires, dig latrines, you know, grow food, all that type of shit. Yes, you're going to need guns, maybe, if that happens, but but the dudes and the ladies that are focused solely on, oh my God, I'm going to get guns. Let's go. Yeah. And they're doing it themselves, by themselves. Yeah, you're going to die. So that's, that's when I... I do like to, I do like to sell books based on Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia being in the same sentence in the news. It's good stuff. Um, I thought of it first. It's up here. So, but I do like to tell people about like the Clay Martins and the Joe Dolios. If you're familiar with them, you know. Prairie Fire, Concrete Jungle, Tactical Wisdom Series. I dig that stuff. I do a thing I call my Daily Dolio, where he's got five books. It's They're just little guides, right, from a Marine, right? And right or wrong, I read a chapter a night in, in one of them, and they're all different. It's cool. And it builds, like muscle memory, it builds questions that you can ask other people, right? So... I think that's the point of, I don't think it's necessarily doomerism. I don't, I don't follow doomers and I've been called a doomer, but I'm like, dog. Yeah. I want to sell my book. It's about the end of the world. However, if you want to survive my book, you go to Clay Martin and you go to Joe Dolio and you go to Don Shift who has a, fun, a fantastic book on uh, surviving a nuclear attack. Everybody is terrified of nuclear weapons because they think, hey, you got, you got nukes coming over. Everybody's going to die. That's not the case, right? I could sit here west of D.C. and D.C. could get hit with a megaton. And I will be fine. My windows will be blown out. But all the fallout's going that way. And even if the fallout came this way, I could be in my basement for a week, two weeks, and I could go outside and I could be fine. It's, yeah, it's, it's nice being positioned on the jet stream, you know, upwind of, of DC. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It You know, people just need to be more educated about it. So, yeah, people... I, I, I think of my doomerism posts as trying to help people get motivated to get off the couch and get educated and go do stuff and better themselves and build a network and do the other things, right? And then I give them resources to do that. I'm not the resource. I'm an idiot that writes books and does that, other stuff, right? That's what a shill for Big Doom would say. Big Doom, exactly. See, that's not the kind of... I mean that's like it's like classic like 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 prepper thinking you know like guys gun guys have been thinking about that stuff for forever yeah we were talking yeah. about shit hits the fan into the world as we know it back on the gun boards in 2000 you know that's right, right. Yeah. but that's that's doom prepping doomerism yeah. would be like uh you know oh the the democrats and republicans are yelling at each other so you know a civil war is absolutely going to happen like right now. or we're in a civil war because my twitter right got and, got and there's no that. and there's no help to come blah 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 yeah. Yeah. it's all it's all over the doomerism i've seen and i think is worse because it's like a mind virus right these guys it think, because we have problems now and a lot of these guys are young so they don't remember the last time we had problems um, because we have problems now is that things are over. It, it's done. It's finished. There's no bouncing back from this, guys. And it's like... It, it's so over. It's so <laughs> over. Like, like, we have problems, and there are laws being passed that we don't like, or we have a, we have a bad president, so the Constitution has failed, and the, the, the this Western yeah. civilization has collapsed, and we need a dictator, and all... Yeah. You see that all the time on Twitter. We need a dictator. We need a seizure. Like, what the fuck? talking about this is ridiculous. It, would be interesting to, it, it would be interesting if to, to look at some of the analytics and see how much of that shit really is getting pushed by chinese and russian bots All right yeah yeah or because, because the people who don't believe any 
people who are very skeptical of anything their own government says, rightly so, are very, very um, less skeptical of shit getting shoveled by the by foreign operators. You know. Well, it, but Mike, have you seen their subways? <laughs> I've seen ours. <laughs> damn it. Yeah, God, uh, damn it. Or, or the or the lack of the lack of postmodernist block soulless blocks of concrete. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Mark, which is worse? Orange line or green line? I will tell you right now, silver line. Okay. It wasn't it wasn't finished before I uh you I know why? I'm never riding the metro again, but it comes to me. Oh. But I had to ride that fucking orange line and then transfer into the Pentagon. God bless America. When I was when I was still living up in uh, uh, Maryland, I w- we would take the green line down for Caps games. And I was just like, this is the worst fucking line on the Metro. I don't, I don't even know about those those <laughs> lines up there in the People's Republic. No. Yeah. No, you know what I remember? I remember getting up at Odark 30 to get drive my ass from Chantilly into Nutley Street okay. to get the train to get to the connection to get to the Pentagon station to take the the heaven elevator all the way up into the fucking Pentagon and then try and find my way around that fucking place to get to my fucking office. Am I the only one that's drinking here? Probably. I had, a, I had a monster. I'm, I'm bouncing. Okay, you're bouncing, but not like me. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. Mike never drinks and it's Lent for me. So I'm like, uh, <laughs> that was my one. And, uh, you gave that up? Yeah. You're going to have to, you're going to have to see us another uh, uh, stream. We'll be, we'll be drinking. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be on, uh, I'm going to be on there. We'll be, there will be bourbon on Monday. With okay. Eric for again. people who are wondering about infrastructure though, I can explain why the New York city subway system is, is, as shitty as it is. Number one, it was opened in 1896. And it's not like they can, it's been running for over 100 years. It's not like they can shut it down to repair it, right? Millions of people ride it a day. And number two, New York City is managed by, well, look at the people who run New York City. Well, well, wait, wait. New York City, I think you mean the Port au Prince of America. <laughs> see? See? I says, see what you did there. Yeah. I see what you did. So, it's awesome. Come on. If New Yorker, it'll get better when New Yorkers, the people who live there and pay the taxes and vote in the local elections, want it to get better. Until then, that actually kind of kind of connected to the whole doomerism thing. So, apparently, recently, a wannabe Brian Stelter, who uh, was why would anybody want to be Brian Stelter? Well, this is the dude who was basically stalking Mr. Larry and then Mike and then me. Oh, so, yo, yes, oh, sir. that guy. Dude, if you want to be Brian Stelter, he's just got to get a Mr. Potato Head costume. Yeah, this guy is literally, a, he's literally a neck beard. He has a neck beard. He's a big fat piece of shit. The best part <laughs> is that's his profile picture. Like he chose. Yeah, oh my that. god! But out, he's out, like out a, of out of his entire reel, that was the best one. But he's, he's like a, <laughs> he's like an aspiring journalist for like the the penny saver and the the advertising papers and like the the what's happening type. Yeah, minor publications, right? This fucking guy. But he was, he he was trying to. I think I think he's trying to clout chase by picking fights with people on Twitter. Um, generally, right wing people. Really wants to be noticed, yeah. But he he apparently uh, quote tweeted uh, part of one of a thread I put up a week or two ago about the the problems with the defeatist. Oh, the Constitution has failed. Blah blah blah. <laughs> He says, well, if nobody's following it, then it didn't it by definition fail? Well, here's the thing. Laws are only as good as the people who live by them. And it's another it's another kind of branch of the the people who want a dictator because they want yeah. a, a top down, they want a top a top down imposed solution that they don't actually have to do anything for. But, but that's the thing, though. It's like, okay, a king can make a decree, but if nobody respects or follows the king's orders, then, like, the decree... And eventually, the king ends, eventually, the king ends up on his own block Yeah, with the headsman's axe coming down. And that has happened guys, in the past. A lot of these guys are saying, like, well, obviously, you know, the Constitution of America has failed, and they, they'll point to, like, you know, their fascist aesthetic. Yeah, like, a Third Reich lasts 10 years, guys. 
<laughs> it ended with the Soviet flag over Berlin. Look, I, I just wish that Baggins is on Twitter would stop inter splicing Chucky with Taylor Swift because it's fucking wrong. God damn. And that's why the Constitution has failed. It, it really is. It really is. It's starting to. I it, believe that like is really cheeks, cheeks, in, cheeks in the armor. Fucking cheeks in the armor. I didn't say cheeks. That's racist. Sorry. I, Your God. cultural sensitivity reader. God damn it. I don't That's what you just call a Chinese tank, right? Cheeks in the armor. I didn't understand any of what he just said. This Stop is it. like some. Uh, no, I, I, I don't either. That, no, that, that no, was, nobody knows. Nobody that knows. That was the definition of a non sequitur, I think. <laughs> okay. I thought it make sure it's not me. Like. Ugh, no. These baggage is inserting their things in the Taylor Swift. <laughs> I thought he was going to go full Gollum, like filthy baggages. <laughs> no, it's literally fucking baggins. Baggages. That's his handle on fucking right. Twitter. Oh. Jesus, oh. He, he he tags me every day about freaking Taylor Swift and where's the where's the third book? Where's the sequel? Blah blah blah. Okay. I got your sequel. It's at your mom's house. Baggins, if you're watching this, please leave Mark alone until we're done with the stream. You can no, last What are you doing? Time. What are you doing? No, I don't want him to leave me alone. For 10 minutes, you can <laughs> hang in there. I mean, okay. Go have 10 a minutes is fine. fine. 10 minutes is fine. Yeah. I mean, this is a good problem to have. The, 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 the actual stalkers? <laughs> abuse and harassment and the stalkers and the, and the every... Hey, I can't tweet a goddamn thing without somebody saying, shouldn't you be writing? No, motherfucker. It's like 10 a.m. I wrote from 5 to 7. I'm done for the day, dude. Shut the fuck up. Go on. That's that's when I write. In the I, I, I do like that. Nobody believes me. Like when you work from home, you like uh, suddenly you're not allowed to have anything other than your job anymore. Right. Like, yes, yeah, yeah. I, just, no. I just grind 14 hours a day. Every day for you. Yeah. That's all I'm doing is typing. Is I'm, I'm typing. By the way, what I see on Twitter goes into my books. It's all in, it's all in there. I've taken all of you. All of you little bastards that harassed me for three years. You're dead. Right, just... You're dead and you're gay <laughs> and you're trans. That's the worst Suck death. Suck it. <laughs> Suck it. And it's Taliban art dealer. <laughs> Go for it. Taliban art dealer. Look him up. He did it. Don't look him up. If you don't already <laughs> follow him, don't look him up. I was going to say, did this uh, account suddenly pop up in uh, late 2020? Like, Sounds like a trap. <laughs> oh, no, it's a trap. It, it, it's, it's a trap. And once you get him on you, you can't get him off. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting ride. I'll tell you that right now. Taliban, he's actually an art dealer. But he's odd, and oh, an odd art dealer, really. What? <laughs> Just saying, he's. I, 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 I cannot believe that I'm talking about Kevin on this live stream. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is bad. This, this is was bad. all his idea. This was a, a long con. This is the long out. con to get Kevin to get people into his art gallery. Jesus Christ, it's the worst follow ever, and he has not. <laughs> He, he has not disappointed me. And even when you let something go, like three days later, he's on it. He's on it like stink on shit. And why don't rice? He's on it like Phil that remains yesterday. She, oh, my God. That exploded. And I don't know why. But we all just let it go today. And Kevin's like, like 4 p.m. today. Hey, look, this is my cock and balls. And this is what Black Rifle Co Coffee Company looks like, blah, 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 whatever. That's the tweet. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not even going to respond to that. Jesus Christ, dude. He's so special. You, you should go find him. Your follows <laughs> then you dick pics with Black Rifle Coffee? No, he put it on the timeline. Okay. No, it's on the timeline. Okay, no. that, that that's normal then. No, the only person that sends me dick pics is Rob Province. <laughs> totally, totally normal Twitter behavior, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> Literally the only person ever sent me dick pics was the big black dude with the huge thing. 
And that was Educated Hillbilly. And he's like, in for a penny, in for a pound, motherfucker. <laughs> Wait, he's black. God damn it, I don't want to wake up to that shit. My province is black. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. He's not really. Oh, so, so oh, he not just really. found dick pics. So he didn't, like, not, I, feel I, like mean, it's, I feel like it's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> If you're gonna send dick pics, it's gotta be your own. So this is no, this no, is it's Dick's other people. Valor. Other people he, other people send me other people's shit. Well, especially like, if it's somebody you know. else's like some porn star's like horse cock, right? You know, it's like you're stealing his mojo, you know. You can't do that shit to me when I'm who's sending crazy. you dick pics of horse cocks, Vosh? <laughs> okay, who's that dude? Oh, you, oh. You know, like, do you know what Brent you don't want to go down? You do not want to go down that rabbit hole. Oh yes, okay. you know what? Yes, he does. I have scotch and a great attitude. I do. <laughs> I do want to go down it. So he, he is a uh, uh, outspoken. And Mike has Mar- looked. Pete, Pete has looked away. He's like, "Fuck this shit." Oh, He's an outspokenly Marxist uh, YouTuber that basically he just owns the cons with all his arguments, which are entirely circular, bad faith, all the shit you expect from a comic. Okay. Well. Um, he had some uh, uh, questionable stances on like um, CP and you know uh, age of consent and uh, bestiality, and uh, every all of his fans were just like, "Oh well, this is just you know him you know making an argument for the sake of argument. He doesn't actually mean it." And then somebody found his old like screenshots of him like browsing the web and that stuff. I'm like, no, he absolutely looks that shit up. My God. You know, yeah, I have an air raider. I have a walk-on air raider that we could line people up and just <laughs> go over them. I mean, it's my, not my air raider. It's my son's because he has yeah. his own business because I'm a normal human. But we could put all those people and tie them up on the ground. I, I mean, in Minecraft. Yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ. In, in, in Minecraft, yes. Or, or wood chippers, whatever. No, it's just cultural enrichment from the co- uh, cartels. Oh, so Of course it is. Of course it is. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's 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 just some weird shit. Yeah, that's that's something you needed to know. So. <sighs> yeah, a little bit worse. <laughs> the what? <laughs> the what? Hope that made your day a little bit worse. <laughs> yeah, my days my days pretty much over. I mean, unless I go upstairs and decide that I want to watch, you know, Dune again or Thirteen Hours or for the hundredth time. Which, which one, whatever. the new Dune or the only good Dune movie, which was the one where Patrick Stewart is running into battle shouting, long live Duke Leto with a pug in his hands. You know, if they just want to put the... Uh, God damn want to put a pug Jesus in Christ. the new Dune movie just as a shout I want to put pugs everywhere. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you follow Uncle Zoe on Twitter? Possibly. I have no idea who I follow on Twitter. So he's he he literally got into guns like maybe like eight years ago and now he does shoot and stuff and he like every day he's out shooting i don't know i i can't shoot that much i don't have that much money but uncle he does zoe gun takes? apparently do what uncle zoe gun takes yeah yeah and he's got the reason i followed him initially is because he has pugs he has like four of them and he calls them the grumble <laughs> a grumble of pugs the grumble Right? It's the grumble. Right? So I was like, oh, and you have guns? Dude, you're my homie. So there it is. But do it's, the pugs it, have guns? The pugs should have guns. Fuck it. It's America. God damn it. I wonder if I could get a small AR for my for my Wookiee. You're working for you. They, they do make the, sm- the tiny uh, guns. The goat guns. Do they? Do yeah. they? Yeah, I've been handing them really? out to the raccoons in my backyard. So, raccoons are fucking. Oh, cartel. don't lie. Raccoons are cartel. You. Those are fucking cartel know. motherfuckers. I know. I'm don't like you. We know you've been giving them the live fire, yeah, full size yeah. weapons. Well, don't give them. I'm not going to say anything until the ATF lawsuit is finished. Don't okay? give like, anything to the possums because those motherfuckers. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm not just telling you. Possum, possums wish they were raccoons. No, raccoons are cool. Possums, that's on the other side, brother. It's on the other side. 
It's wrong. This would be a this would be a great spot for one of those uh, vintage Captain America. This would be a great spot right for there. Terry Shepard to come in and go. Let me tell you what about possums. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 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 getting a whole uh, unit of them. It's basically like um, unit. Yeah, of a of, okay. of uh raccoons. unit of possums. Is that no no is no? That that's called like a dance of devils. Yeah, it's a unit no. of possums. Uh, we're gonna call it uh, Force Recoon. So. <laughs> Oh God! I'm really regretting I'm not drinking tonight. I'm, I'm getting them tiny little um, uh, flak jackets <laughs> so that we can wear. And then they're... You can tell we're getting to the two-hour mark here. <laughs> oh yeah, we're very definitely getting to the two-hour mark. Go on, <laughs> Taylor Swift, Devil. <laughs> Never. Oh man! All right, uh, yeah. I'm gonna call. Okay, it. so this is usually about where we wrap it up. So, uh, Mark. You got your you got your uh, book that you could talk about Rebel Moon. What else do you got? What do you Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon. No, that's Rebel actually Moon. Zack Snyder. The movie. fuck are you talking about, dog? <laughs> We're at the two I, I, I did like that. I did. I, I did like the movie, but it's not me. Oh really? You liked Battle of the Planets? Like <laughs> I, I I dig it, dude. I dig it. But Mongol Moon. Mongol Moon. Mo yes, Mongol. Moon. Or that you know, Kubla. Well, he was. So what else, what else would you like to promote to the audience here? Well, you... Not a goddamn thing. I'm yeah. done. <laughs> no, uh, uh, Mongol Moon, Dance of Devils. Seriously, I would, above all else, I would, I would hit that Mongol Moon Audible because if you wanna, if you want your earballs to be massaged by Terry Shepard's voice. Right. Oh, just his that. voice, damn it! I mean, but you can picture him in the leather pants yeah. and shit. You can picture him in that white, black doesn't matter. We've all seen it. We've all seen it. It's no, good. we haven't. No. no. Well, you got to buy really the book, Mike. Uh, that's. I mean, you got to go get item it. That comes with it. Uh, I feel the need to go watch Sicario, but okay. But <laughs> movie no, night, I, Sicario, I don't have any Rebel man. Moon. <laughs> Rebel man, Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a whole nother thing, man. It's a whole nother thing that my daughter went through when she was like eight. God damn it. Yeah, what the hecky decky, Mike? What the hecky decky, Mike? God damn it. Wait, she went through Rebel Moon when she was eight? Or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. It it was it was her rebel phase, but it only lasted one lunar cycle. I'm just so a civilian. Short. I don't know about rebels. And moons. Okay, so Pete, <laughs> <laughs> this is my way of saying let's go. Yeah. Well, I uh, can just about wrapping up uh, Legacy of Terror. So that'll be coming out on the 29th. The, the book, right? Not your actual yes. Legacy of Terror. Yes. I mean, we could be well, doing it live. Let's do we, it we live. We talk Eight. about the we talk about the book publicly. We don't talk about the other stuff yeah. publicly. Eddie's doing it live. <laughs> <laughs> My reign of terror will continue as long as I'm tired of Legacy of terror. So, so yeah, uh, Brangen's Black Arts number thirteen that comes out uh, in just about two weeks. Um, the audio for non-state actors should hopefully be coming out sometime next month and uh yeah after that uh, gonna be rolling into the next uh no sf book for war game well, which hopefully book one should be launching sometime this summer excellent. excellent you already got a name picked out or keeping that under the wraps for the the wargate book the, the Wargate, um, the series is going to be called Edge of Imperium. And book one is uh, Spheres of Influence. All right. Nice. So, oh my God. I look forward I, to the Space King episode about that. I got some good. You had to have some mention of Space King tonight. We had to. <laughs> it's, it's a thing now. Oh, I don't know what yeah. Space King is, but. Oh, yeah. I have a video for you to watch. Um, Jesus Christ. Speaking of, uh, but I got some good news. It's taken a long time, but finally, my last two books 
Trouble Walked In and the Family Business have been finally put over to audio. They'll be available from Amazon this month, later this month, both of them. So if you like audiobooks, you should go get those. I think the voice actors did a good job on both of them. All right. Nice. That's good. That's good. All right. And then, Coop, what are we drinking? Yeah, Coop, um, what the fuck are right you now? getting up to? <laughs> What's up? What I told you, the you raccoon. Getting? What takes up most of my oh, day? Shit. They're fucking nocturnal. <laughs> Oh, I'm just drinking orange soda right now, brother. Fuck. No, I mean, I, you're like five miles from me. Oh, we drinking. <laughs> we'll we'll figure something out. We can't I do this we publicly. <laughs> All right, we will see y'all next month, folks. We're out. All right. Peace out. Later. <laughs>